so without further hesitation, let me welcome everyone uh, to this panel. Um, I am Pavel Luksha. Uh, I lead the initiative called Global Education Futures. Uh, I'm based in Moscow. We are an international initiative uh, working around the globe. And uh, the topic of the session today is uh, education for societal transformation. And uh, it's not only about the fact that we need to change education. It's the fact that education needs to become in service of massive changes that are required for our civilization. We all are aware of the fact that uh, modern civilization is deeply not sustainable uh, in terms of its relationship with the planet. It's also not very sustainable in terms of relationship with itself. The issues of uh, social inequality, lack of uh, diversity, and also the way that we handle our own development, including technological development, represents many risks that uh, jeopardize the future of our civilization, even our own species. Potentially, we can uh, disappear from this planet if we continue on the current pathway within uh, a few centuries. We will, and uh, by when we go, we will also destroy uh, the majority of uh, biosphere and planetary systems. So this is a huge, huge risk that the current model of civilization represents and we need to change it. So education has been discussed as a vehicle for social transformation, for social evolution. Why? Because education can uh, create worldviews at the mass scale. It can program skills of people. It give, give, can give new skills that allow people to handle complex situations, to adapt to the ones that emerge. It can set up human, uh, new human norms and values. And by that can propagate a different way of being of our civilization. Also, education can play a role of a safety space, a kind of sandbox where new ways of being and new technologies and new solutions, new social innovations can be modeled and then propagated around the, the, in the world. So education can play that role as a social transformation vehicle. And uh, today we are going to focus in this panel on different practical formats that people are using to actually do it. So I would like to highlight at least three types of uh, conversation that we need to have the, in this panel today to be very practical. Uh, one is that we need to change the existing curriculum. And we need to both uh, create, we need first of all to create curriculum that will be human and life-centered and planet-oriented. We need to increase our emotional and empathic capability. We need to increase our ability of cooperating with one another at a larger scale, recognizing the diversity, recognizing deep human needs that exist in our society and empathizing with them. We need to increase our responsibility and our accountability for what is happening in the world, what we are doing with our planet and how can we personally change that situation? How can we empower, especially next generation, to bring that change? And also, how can we create future skills, the skills that are needed for the transforming civilization and for uh, new technologies and new ways of being included in different relationship with uh, nature or environment? Second type of uh, uh, conversation is accelerators, all kinds of projects that uh, for educational formats that allow us to create uh, new technologies raise uh, teams that uh, create technological and social innovations. And third one I think is very deeply important is uh, learning communities that, for social transformation that can create knowledge, create technologies, model new ways of being, and really model it at a large scale. And uh, I would like to also welcome conversations about what the role can traditional education play, like universities. Universities have been playing that role for industrial society. What can it be for the next stage of uh, development where we need to change our patterns and our ways of being? And in addition to that, what can uh, formats outside of traditional education do, like complementary education? Uh, learning communities, and finally, what we call learning ecosystem, the complex networks of educational providers working together for human thriving. So I will welcome everyone to the panel and um, 
Alberto, I would like to pass to you for your introductory notes, and then we will listen from this uh, panel that will introduce this, uh, themselves as they speak. Thank you. Uh, I am Alberto Zucconi, the present chair of the Board of Trustees of the World Academy and a Secretary General of the World University Consortium. I want to thank you all the panelists uh, for being on board uh, this morning and also thank you very much uh, for all the people we're not going to see but there are many from uh, the administration uh, and support uh, that make uh, this uh, uh, conference possible so thank you uh, education we always uh, talk about education like education is one i think uh, is not at all it depends on what kind of education we're talking about. There are forms of education that actually are obsolete, and so they are really part of the problem and not of the solution of humanity challenge. Also, there are so many pedagogies that are often uh, you know, hidden on uh, what we call education, uh, but not, uh, uh, you know, silent in terms of their fact. Every pedagogy has is uh, being uh, rooted in the vision of human beings and also in the vision of change. What is knowledge? So what I'm talking about uh, very simply is that uh, education and especially educational institution are important aspect of the social construction of reality. And in the past, and also in the present, have been serving as some useful purposes, offering some useful tools, still valid nowadays. And at the same time, have been doing a lot of damage and a lot of damage, in my opinion, is done today and will be done tomorrow if we don't make education more transparent, more transparent also on value and goals, and more participatory. Here we're talking about the leadership in the 21st century. Well, how we uh, organized education is uh, very relevant about uh, if we foster new leader or not. For example, we know, and we have a lot of research, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, that uh, student-centered, people-centered education uh, has better results of uh, counter-retainment and, uh, you know, but also has uh, much more important uh, effect uh, on developing uh, critical thinking uh, and uh, leadership. So I hope uh, we can address uh, why we can continue like this, not to speak uh, about racism, uh, you know, discrimination, uh, sexes, minority. And so how we can make a better education uh, that would foster sustainable leader for today and tomorrow. We need it badly. So the first uh, speaker is John Cowley from uh, UNESCO. Please, John, like everybody else, introduce yourself and, and let us hear what you want to say. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Alberto, for the invitation to speak. So I work for UNESCO, but not in UNESCO's education sector, which is a very big and very important part of UNESCO. Uh, I work in the social and human science sector of UNESCO uh, on issues of social transformation. So I'm looking at education from the outside, but of course, uh, well aware of what my colleagues in uh, education are doing and aware of some of the contradictions they have to deal with. And it's the contradictions I'd like to focus on uh, in these introductory remarks. Um, the question ultimately is a very simple one. Um, do we have any transformative model, by which I mean model of transformation for systems in general or for education in particular, that is not destructive. Because it's very clear that the limits of incremental change have been reached and the pandemic has simply revealed some of the tensions uh, that make incrementalism uh, unviable. 
Incrementalism has responded, among other things, to demographic changes, to changes in the perception of what education is for, to changes in uh, the job market, with in particular the transformation of the skill set required for uh, early adult employment, uh, transformations in market pressures, particularly for higher education, which has been globalized on a consumerist basis for reasons that are very understandable in the context of another important shift, financial pressure on education systems to make them more efficient, but without necessarily knowing efficient in doing what. And finally, of course, the pressures of technology, partly positive, partly negative, which have transformed the way in which uh, education can be delivered. The scope of incremental change is considerable and every system from primary school to graduate school shows evidence of the considerable capacity for incremental change. But at some point, as one knows from systems theory in general terms, incremental change hits a wall. And what we don't have is a model of incremental transformation. Historically, the way in which things get transformed is that the old is destroyed and replaced by something else. But, and here I have to talk obviously as a UNESCO official, education is a human right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We can't simply sweep everything away, sacrifice a generation and rebuild a model. Even assuming that that technocratic top-down model of transformation made any sense. So this is the challenge, the challenge of combining at a scale that is pretty unique. I mean, every corporation can ask the question about incrementalism versus transformationalism. But if they get it wrong, it hurts their workers, shareholders, suppliers, and so on. It hurts an ecosystem that might be considerable, but it's not the whole human population. And if we say that human beings have an inherent human right to education, we have to be able to specify to what, and ensure that the transition between the old system and the new system preserves that right. And that's the challenge we face. And it's a challenge that of course, goes in the direction of institutional conservatism and tends to entrench um, additional models of incrementalism where you try to add something to a system that actually doesn't accommodate what you're trying to add to it. You try to massify higher education without changing its fundamental character and then you're surprised that it doesn't work. You try to graft technology onto teaching methods, and unsurprisingly, the graft doesn't take too well. Uh, you try to include ever more new areas of learning in the curriculum, and you're surprised that there are no longer enough hours to teach basic skills, literacy, numeracy, and so on. And this is what I would like to discuss here. My five minutes are basically up. I won't go any further than that, than, than to raise this question. Can we imagine a non-destructive transformative model that wouldn't destroy the right to education while making education systems fit for the 21st century? And I'd be very pleased to hear what you have to say about that. Quite important. And each of the panelists that can share on the supporting material made available forever on the links and on the World Academy much more materials to deepen uh, what you important you have to say. Uh, Ramos Pricope is next, uh, and the others uh, you announce, uh, Pavel, so we alternate, okay? Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, session. Uh, difficult uh, question, and uh, <clears throat> I think if we are to answer this question, we have to anchor in the reality of educational systems around the world. And uh, never mind, we are talking about uh, Romania, Italy, United States, or uh, Russia, or whatever uh, a country from Africa. With different proportions, we'll find the same illnesses. One of the illnesses is uh, access and equity. We have this issue in Africa and in the United States and in Russia and in Romania. And we have the instruments to address this, the capacity to address this, the finance to address this, but we don't do it. We mentioned this also last night in the session. Why? Because we are not committed enough. We are not coherent. 
let me tell you another very simple problem. We are speaking about technology, about online education, but we have huge differences in terms of um, uh, computer skills of teachers. We have a 19 years old uh, teacher in front of uh, 14 years old kids, and they are playing by WhatsApp and whatever and doing really education in these pandemic times. And we have other people who, uh, I will not say they are not skilled enough. They don't conceive. They cannot accept education can be done through this. So from the beginning, we have these differences, huge differences. Also, if you look at the discourse of any politician about education, they will say all the same. Uh, we need to invest in education. We need to respect our teachers. We need to assure the resources for our schools. But when you go to the uh, school ground, you will find unpaid teachers. You will find inappropriate buildings. And my question is where we have to invest in buildings. Sure, it's one of the components but maybe we have to invest in other uh, uh, components. Uh, and I'll uh, give you an example immediately. And uh, we'll see, as I mentioned, uncoherent policies to address very simple um, uh, aspects. And uh, I can go, I, I'll give you an example because I mentioned it's uh, about uh, uh, investment. When I was Minister of Education, it was a discussion in the cabinet meeting to buy tablets or computers for all kids. This is a, not a new uh, idea. In some countries, it really happened. So to invest millions of euro to buy hardware. And I said, no, I would like to use this money to increase the skills of professors in terms of um, uh, computer skills and also to invest in software. So before to buy a laptop or a tablet, I would like to know what is going to happen with this tablet in the classroom or what would be the application. And we developed at that moment, very complicated, the project of transforming all the textbooks on, a, on a, a, a digital textbooks. And I conclude because I still have one minute saying the reason for which we are not we don't have clear um, projects for the education. It's because we don't have a clear understanding of the education. Education became a system, finance, control, supported by the state 150, 200 years ago, when the objective was very clear to support the state. All countries who introduced the compulsory education the idea was to support the state, to have qualified people to work for the state, to build bridges, to build uh, uh, the medical system and so on. Today, I think it's still available this objective, but it's also something more. And we have to pay attention to the personal development of our kids. And if we go, and I'll conclude with this idea, we will see edu school is not any longer the only actor in building uh, uh, the citizens or the individuals. We have, uh, you know, many, many other educators uh, in, in the system, like uh, mass media, like uh, uh, social media, like uh, um, uh, different other resources, which we didn't have 40, 30, uh, years ago. My time is uh, out. Maybe I'll have the chance to go further with this idea in a second round. Pavel? Yes, I would like to transit to the next uh, panelist, I think. It will be more useful to, to go around. Because the just trying to see what, what's the other. Who, who is who is coming the next? Alberto, you have control over that, please. Oh yeah, I, <laughs> I 
I welcome you to just just name the next panelists. One. So I believe I'm the next panelist. I'm Olivier Brechard. I work at CRI in Paris. CRI is an interdisciplinary research center. And in fact, it, it, it works in, in the fields of learning, teaching, finding new ways of researching. And it acts as a challenge research institute for the University of Paris, for many schools, for the city of Paris also. And I think learning cities and learning ecosystems are key. And it works with the state as, as defining what will be a learning society. That's a, a first element, but truly, uh, CRI is now focusing all of its efforts to support, inspire, and empower learners to address complex problems, okay? Problems that can't be uh, addressed as just a school or university or company, and these are mainly aligned with the SDGs. So together with UNESCO, we launched an initiative called the Learning Planet. And the idea is to create a movement that will allow the youth and all learners of all ages to collectively work on finding new solutions. We want to help everyone, to contribute to help everyone, to learn to take care of oneself, take care of the others, and take care of the planet. So in a way, Remus, these are the kind of uh, global direction in which we are going, uh, is, is, is this idea of care at the heart of learning. And it is also the idea of exploring the future, not having a set of knowledges that are already known and shared and that people learn uh, as individuals, but making sure that people work as team from the youngest age with some real kind of youth scientist approach, which help have them have reflexivity on what they learn, but really they cannot also kind of choose some of the subjects they want to address because these are priority subjects. Uh, and the idea is together with mentors, with scientists, with artists, with their teachers, to explore the really new fields for which we don't yet have answers. So this is a radically new approach in a way to education. And in order to make this happen, we are creating a kind of middle ground, virtual and real middle ground. So what, how does this work? We need networks of regional hubs in cities, in other places, which are at the forefront of learning so that they can connect together. What happens in the field of of web of, of the coding, what happens in science is that you can build on the shoulders of each other to, to innovate. What happens in the field of education is that we have thousands of, or tens of thousands of great innovators doing incredible things all over the world, but separately. And you don't make progress on top of each other. So we are trying to find a way to have a kind of open global campus with plenty of digital tools like uh, Open Connect ID, like a GitHub of educational projects, like the ways of navigating all these educational projects, like a GPS of knowledge that will help connect these communities. But many, many players are trying to do so. So the key there is how do we make sure that we don't all do the same thing, we don't all invest in platforms and solutions, but we match what we are doing and we connect them. So that's one element which is digital and which is highly needed. The other one are the local players because it's, it's locally that things are happening really. Another dimension is we need to create inspiration and empowerment. And to this, we want to create a movement and we want to put youth at the heart. So I think much more youth in a for, for an, another uh, conversation like this one should be present. So we're working with the European Student Union, with uh, the, the people from the school, so that they create a movement where their voice is heard about what is the future of education because they are the people. And this is very aligned with a report by UNICEF, WHO, and the Lancet, which was published in February 2020 about a future, uh, yeah, future for the world's children, saying that maybe the SDGs would be more meaningful if we could implement them as rights for the children in the future, right for uh, not polluted air, right for proper addiction. So we are trying to align this with uh, with tribunes and with movement, creating this movement. And we also want to celebrate what works because we are very often talking about the problems. Well, if we celebrate the best practices, the best learning methodologies, then we can change things. And that's why, and I'm in charge of a Learning Planet Festival together with UNESCO to celebrate learning every 24 January. But this is about creating the momentum and spreading. So I think my time is off, but I'm very happy to, to go further a bit later and very happy to be with you all. And, and meeting some some known faces uh, like Vishal and saying hello to and Pavel for sure. Thank you, Oliver. Very important topic. Uh, and uh, next uh, is Alexei. Hello. Uh, 
Good to see you. Uh, I represent the community of practice, uh, the community of uh, extended education at the same time. Um, uh, it's called uh, Kruzhok movement, which is uh, the movement of uh, young uh, technological enthusiasts and the communities of makers, uh, researchers, and uh, teachers, entrepreneurs, engineers, who uh, uh, try to uh, apply new technologies to solving real problems uh, and uh, uh, engage and uh, empower young people to join these uh, practices. Uh, I would say that uh, during this crisis, uh, uh, we see that uh, makers communities uh, join uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, try uh, new practices of uh, building new uh, tools for uh, uh, medic, uh, medicine and etc. So I, I would say that this uh, uh, small communities started to change uh, their practices uh, rapidly according to the situation. And uh, uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, the new uh, uh, kind of education, the new way of education uh, should be based on uh, uh, zone, uh, zones of practicing. We call it uh, practice in futures when uh, young people try to uh, uh, apply uh, new technologies to solving problems and try to build their uh, own communities uh, based on the new rules, based on the new practices. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, it, it is not possible to build a future without young people encouraged uh, in this pro process and uh, applying their uh, ideas and dreams in, in this process. Um, I think that um, this uh, communities uh, can be uh, connected between uh, different countries, different cultures. And I totally agree with the previous speaker that uh, it creates uh, uh, great learning opportunities uh, to uh, not just listening about uh, new uh, technologies and uh, listening about new uh, problems, uh, but also trying to solve it by uh, yourself, trying to solve it together with uh, people from uh, other countries. I think that uh, one more thing I would say here is that uh, uh, we uh, often uh, talk about uh, serious things, but uh, future, I think, cannot be um, uh, practice, uh, practices without playing it. So you, you need to play new models of uh, living. You need to play new models of learning. So uh, playing is a very uh, major uh, thing uh, in the, the new uh, way of education. So thank you. Thank you to you. And uh, now it's time uh, for Vishay Tarreya. Are you here? Uh, yes, Albert. Here I'm here. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vishal. Uh, I work in India. I run an organization called Dream a Dream. Uh, I can say that I'm already a, a bit uncomfortable being on this panel since it's an all-male panel talking about the future of education and society. Uh, so we are already in trouble. Uh, but I'm, since, since I'm here, I will share some of my reflections. Uh, I think the first uh, piece I want to talk about is that uh, before we talk about education, uh, as a tool for societal transformation, as a pathway to societal transformation, we need to acknowledge and accept the fact that currently education is failing all our children. Uh, and this current pandemic has been a real uh, revealing factor about why education is failing all our children. Uh, one, uh, you know, for, for many years now, we've been talking about how education needs to focus on preparing children for the future. Well, the future is here right now. It's already happened. Uh, and the question we have to ask ourselves is that, uh, did we do enough to prepare our children for this current crisis? To help our children make sense of this current crisis, adapt to it, respond to it. And at least I can tell you from an Indian experience, we didn't. Uh, 
Second, for the longest time, the role of education has really been around uh, helping children become job ready, helping children be ready for the job markets to generate an income. Uh, and that has what has led to a whole series of economic challenges, climate crisis that we're living in, because we have reduced the role of education to really just be about finding a job and earning a living. Uh, whereas the role of education, we all know and recognize and understand is much more broader. It's around helping our children learn to be happy for themselves, learn to help others, make others happy, uh, learn to thrive as individuals in society, and at the same time, help their societies and the planet to thrive. Uh, learn to develop the life skills and the social emotional competencies that are needed for them to become productive, contributing members of a society and a planet. Uh, and in many of those counts, uh, education has failed our children, specifically in countries like India. Uh, education has also brought to the forefront the systemic and structural challenges that have existed in our education system. The inequities have come to the forefront. Now, again, if I take an example from this pandemic, uh, when schools were closed down and we started focusing on uh, digital learning and online resources, so more than 70% of children in India do not have access to digital resources, online tools, internet. Uh, and uh, we were talking to a bunch of our kids in our programs and we had this eighth grader uh, who said, you know, her school started online classes her parents didn't have money to buy an internet package. She convinced her parents to buy her an internet package to attend a class. She was five minutes late to the class and her teacher marked her absent and didn't let her attend the class. So what we have done is the inherent prejudices that we have of education in the offline system, now we have just taken them to an online system. We had another instance of a 14 year old girl who was great in education, loved going to school, was top in ranks. And because she couldn't get to her online classes because her parents couldn't afford to buy internet package, she got so anxious and distressed by that, she committed suicide. So we have to first recognize that education in the current form is failing our children. So old world, incremental solutions are not going to work. And if education is going to fail our children, there is no hope absolutely that education will actually contribute to societal transformation. And I'll probably stop there and maybe come back with some ideas of what, how I believe we can transform education. Thank you. Thank you. And now Rodolfo turns. Rodolfo, unmute. Yes, yes, uh, I have to. I have to share my screen um, somewhere because uh, I like I like to show just uh, one slide. No, okay. A a anyway. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but uh, sharing sharing doesn't work, and so oh, I have I have to I have to go then. I have to go by word. Yeah. And so, I, human life cannot be. I mean, I am I am a Rodolfo Fiorini. I am a, a, a World Academy trustee and a professor of, of bioengineering at Politecnico Milan, and uh, um, and since uh, ten years ago. I start uh, in inquiring, uh, you know, the difference between uh, the usual uh, scientific approach and, the, and the, uh, the new scientific approach to, to use uh, to prepare a, an education transformation. And so, uh, uh, human life cannot be fully understood in terms of generalization and statistics. We need to take into account the role of conscious individuality in human affairs. Human accomplishment is the product of subconscious sensations, conscious perceptions and forces that are influenced by past events, present perception and future possibilities. 
the reunification of these three dimensions of time into a triple, triple time vision will mark an important contribution to the emergence of the new anthropic scientific method. So we are just in the transition from the classic scientific method, the, the, the reductionist Newtonian method that uh, we were educated from, to the anthropo uh, scientific method, where for the first time, the human component is taken into account. You know, uh, uh, um, Mm, uh, I really appreciated the comment of uh, John Crowley before when uh, uh, he talked about uh, uh, destructive and non-destructive transformation. And it is, this is the fundamental difference between the classic scientific method that is destructive and the, anthropo uh, the new anthropo-scientific method that is non-destructive non trans transformative model. And that's that why, because we, if we use the, the usual uh, reductionistic approach, uh, we are referring to system theory. So system theory is uh, just uh, the, the usual uh, understanding that we have, is the understanding that we got from our education from the past. That is uh, the reference of the uh, system theory developed by von Bertalaffi in the 40s and 50s. And that, and that, that was uh, almost based on the Newtonian reductionistic approach. So the, dist the destructive model, we have to switch to the new one that is uh, a, based on uh, uh, the, new, the new vision, the ant anthropo-scientific vision that is uh, based on uh, um, uh, uh, quantum field theory. And quantum field theory uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, a non-destructive approach in the sense that uh, um, as uh, uh, Ramus, uh, uh, I, I heard Ramus uh, uh, say many times, coherence, coherence, coherent systems. Okay, coherence is not a property of the old past system theory, because uh, the, uh, the best that you can do with the old statistical approach is to have a synchronization of your system at macro level. If you want coherence, you have to go to the uh, to the micro level, and then and then a uh, coherence is one of the basic properties of quantum field theory. And and so uh, I think that uh, this is the the fundamental difference that we have to really to be aware of if we want to avoid confusion, uh, uh, disseminated confusion, because uh, right now we need the concept clarity first. Absolutely, and then we can we be ready to go on. Otherwise, we will be unable to solve any problem at all. I stop here. Thank you, Rodolfo. And there is a question to the from the public uh, to John. Uh, the question basically is, uh, John, uh, are you talking uh, when you refer to your previous speech? Uh, to education eh, or the transformation eh, of the whole society? It's a good question. You can see my attempt to answer it in the chat box or in the question and answer box. I was clearly talking about the education system, but it's important to recognize that the education system isn't closed. And indeed, some of the current adaptive dynamics are making it less closed uh, with the emphasis, for instance, on lifelong learning and on informal education, um, breaking down the clear boundaries between the education system and what lies outside it. Um, the only thing I can say in response to the specific question is that if you can't imagine transformation at the level of a semi-closed subsystem, it's going to be even harder to imagine it at the level of a fully integrated macro system. So maybe let's start with the education system, treating it as semi-closed, recognizing that its closure is incomplete and perhaps less complete than it used to be and see how far we can get with that. But of course, there are broader social dynamics that are going to impact on every aspect of access to education, performance in education, social consequences of education, obviously. Thank you. And there was another question from the public uh, asking uh, probably to Vishal, 
uh, that to raise the topic, how can we equalize and give equal opportunity to poor students uh, uh, that uh, have a double hardship uh, in, uh, you know, using education? Yes, thank you, Alberto. And I've kind of responded to the question in, in the uh, Q&A box, but uh, let me put some perspective onto it. Uh, the Brookings Institution uh, a couple of years back came up with a report called Why Wait 100 Years, where they stated that if we continue with the same approach to education that we have today, it is going to take uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds or low-income countries or from low-income communities at least six generations to catch up to the level of education attainment of children in uh, high-income countries or from high income backgrounds. And what they had proposed is what we need is uh, to reduce this inequities in education is leapfrogging strategies, uh, which is largely around completely reimagining and repurposing education. Uh, and one big piece of our own work at Dream Dream uh, to remove these inequities has been, how do we transform educational environments uh, to be highly contextual and customized and personalized to every student? Uh, how do we bring in more care and authenticity and empathy in learning environments within the school system, through the school leadership, through the teachers? Because largely the biggest thing that children from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds are struggling with is early experiences of childhood adversity, which means when children in their early years of growing up experience lack of food or nutrition, lack of emotional care, neglect, abuse, violence, it impacts their ability to achieve developmental milestones, resulting in what we call failure to thrive or stunting. And with that kind of a challenge, when you enter a school system, you do not have the abilities to engage with learning. So you cannot have a one size fits all education system. You need to customize the education systems to meet the requirements of children who have had failure to thrive. So it's possible we are doing it uh, in, in India, uh, but that's that's the big thing we need to shift. Thank you. And now, Pavel, let's go for the second round. Uh, you start. Hey, uh, oh. Alberto. Alber uh, oh, Carlos, I see we're censoring you, Carlos. Uh, uh, we really wanted not to hear what you have to say. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, 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 <laughs> friend. Uh, Forgive us, uh, please uh, go ahead and then Pavel uh, would uh, introduce the next round. <laughs> really, we are not really uh, handling this right. Uh, Carlos, we are friends. I hope that we're going to be still friends after the session. Alberto, what oh. my friendship? I'm also on the list. Oh, you're not. Uh, they give us uh, a, an obsolete list. Uh, so, after Carlos, uh, Harry, you. It's not a question of friendship. I'm on the list, but that's fine. Not on mine. Uh, uh, <laughs> Carlos is the last one, but that's not the issue. As soon as Carlos finishes, uh, you are next, uh, Gary. So, Alberto, we are still friends. Don't, don't, don't worry. And uh, I will be provocative, but don't be afraid. Um, first of all, I would, I would say that I'm a member of the executive committee of the Club of Rome and, and together with our co-president Mampela Rampele and with Petra Kunkel, I'm the coordinator of the Emerging New Civilizations Initiative of the club on which we have a panel later today. And uh, I'm not a specialist in education, so in a certain way I don't deserve to be in this panel. But I will try to play the role of uh, pointing to some of our blind spots and to give voice to people who maybe would deserve more than myself to be on the, on the panel. The first blind spot has been already mentioned, and it is the fact that we are discussing uh, the future of education in a panel only with men, so uh, which would have been, haven't been surprising 20 or 30 years ago, but fortunately today, we are surprised because of that and because of the fact that if we have no women, we have no mothers in the panel. So to a certain extent, we are all talking from a theoretical perspective, right, on this. 
So first blind spot. And what I learned from, uh, from a Club of Rome colleague and SNCC is that the future of education is about unlearning. Maybe this sounds provocative, but it is about unlearning some core ideas which are at the center of our educational systems today. One of them uh, being that we have to unlearn the idea that since that we can be, uh, that we are better than nature just because we are able to destroy it. We are not better than nature. We are, uh, as my friend Lynn Gorison says, we, we are much dumber than nature. Nature has been experimenting for millions of years and is able to create a multitude of viable forms of life without waste and with very few elements. Uh, we are just apprentices. A second idea that I think we have to unlearn is the same idea but applied to other cultures. So the dominant culture, the Western culture, the, the culture who has been dominating the world in the last two centuries is not better than other cultures just because we are we are able to destroy them, to win wars over them and to destroy them and to destroy their, their culture. Because in both cases, both nature and cultures, we are not able to control them. And maybe the third idea we have to learn is that education is not about teaching. It's about learning. And uh, many years ago, Loris Malaguzzi said, kids have 100 languages, but we still them 99. So education, the education we still know today is pretty much about putting things into boxes, fragmenting experiences, non-systemic perspectives, not looking at inter interdependencies, and uh, having a perspective of productivity, you know, applied also to education. A lot of what we have to also to learn is that education is not about being productive. It's about being a person, you know, a human person at peace with uh, herself or himself and with the world and with nature, which is much more related to caring and health and taking care of each other and of nature rather than being productive at uh, anything. And just to finish, uh, because we have been asked to, to submit some practical suggestions, I would like to mention Three of them. One is the Reggio Emilia approach, which was developed 70 years ago and applied in a number of schools around the world. Let's look at it again because it's based on these ideas that I've been mentioning, interdependencies, relationships, and so on. The second example is the restoration of sovereignty of education to the First Nations in Canada that my colleague Shilin Murray has been involved in, and it happened just two years ago. A good example of uh, learning the wrong ideas. And the third example, which I think is extremely relevant for our discussion, is the example of, that John Gilmore has been developing in South Africa with the LEAP method and the LEAP schools, where he has been creating a, a framework for the poorest among the poor the kids of South Africa who have been taught learned helplessness, we have been taught that their culture is not valid, is not, it's not valuable. And is this method brings them self-liberation and the capacity to be proficient in science and mathematics. These are concrete examples of things which are happening, which I think go in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. And now finally, Gary. The, the joke is, Alberto, I didn't know that I was on the panel until Vasugi pointed out that my, my name is there. Uh, and uh, so that's why I uh, interrupted. I'm glad, just I would like to deal with this issue up front about the women because uh, it's so important to us. Uh, actually, we had one woman on this panel who Sue Henderson canceled last night because her son announced he's getting married and she had to fly to Denver, but that's not the point. On the first day in the inaugural session, or I congratulated us that we managed to get so many talented, bright women for this conference, including the inaugural session. And I think it's about one third 
or 40% of the speakers in the conference are women, somehow or other, <laughs> we managed not to get one of them in this session. But, uh, and we've been trying hard and it is very important that we do that. So I'm happy that it comes up uh, and isn't left. Uh, I'd just like to mention uh, this session, which we've called uh, the uh, Education for Social Transformation. We had another session yesterday, which Pavel and uh, uh, Wittel Kinsner were uh, uh, managing, which is the social, uh, the, uh, the transformation of global education. And I think the two topics are getting a little mixed and we have speakers talking on both of them, which uh, both are very important topics. And I just wanted to clarify why we had two uh, and didn't do a good enough job of maybe clarifying the distinction between them because they do sound very similar. In 2013, when we had a conference at the UN uh, here, in, in, not here, but in Geneva, uh, on the need for a global social transformation. Uh, we found that in all the topics we were discussing, there was a shortage of clarity as to how do you transform global society or how do you transform anything for that matter. And after the conference, we were approached by the United Nations Association in New York, which is the Association of UN Employees, asking, can you offer us a course or courses or master's programs to help our staff of the UN system really understand what the process of global social transformation is or social transformation is? And as a result of that, because we realized we did not have that uh, as a codified product ourselves, we started launching a set of courses. We called them courses in Dubrovnik uh, on an annual basis, I think we did about 15 of them, looking at dimensions of this process of how does humanity transform itself? Even how humanity evolves is not very clear, but how do we rapidly, consciously transform ourselves? And that was really part of the rationale for this project, the Global Leadership in the 21st Century uh, project. I'm a business consultant, and I, in working with international business, I've constantly come across executives who are been taught MBA business background on how to grow a company, but don't seem to understand anything really about how society changes and transforms itself. And business is playing a critically central role in that today. And of course, the same is important for our NGOs, the, the global civil society, which is becoming such an important uh, force uh, in society today, just in the last 30 years. I'm also a member of Club of Rome and had many discussions with Carlos and Petra and the team there about the need. And that's why we partnered, the club and the WASA partnered on this issue of, we just had a, a seminar three months ago on the process of social transformation. And I guess the point of this, uh, this description is that this is itself a very, very, very important subject on which global knowledge is very much lacking. Why is it lacking? It's lacking for a number of reasons. One, because the pace of change is going so quickly. Two, because for the first time, we really are a global society and globally interconnected. Three, because our bodies of knowledge are so fragmented even today between disciplines. And that's why we've been doing courses of which we call transdisciplinary to try to understand the interaction between these three, these different forces, the economic, the social, the political, the ecological, the technological, the intellectual, the, trans, the educational. And fourth, we had some wonderful programs uh, at Dubrovnik, which Alberto was very active in, on the way we think and the kind of thinking that we're teaching. And this is another theme with, with Carlos and Club of Rome too, on the fact that our thinking itself is, counter, is counterproductive to really understanding global social processes or social processes 
themselves. So I just wanted to reiterate, I think that uh, regardless of the problems in transforming education, which are monumental uh, and rightly have been flagged, there is a need even within the educational system to deliver a different knowledge than it's delivering today, to break down disciplinary by, by boundaries and silos. And that's very important. Uh, I just wanted to flag that later today, we have another session on this topic, uh, trying to go forward on it. It's, it's called a master's course in the process of global leadership and social transformation. It's really trying to operationalize how we would do it, what we would teach, and how we would do it differently uh, in order to address this issue. And, uh, and some of you are already involved in that. All of you have relevant experience to participate to it. And we would be very interested to collaborate with you as we go forward on it. Thank you. Thank you. Pavel, go ahead for the second round. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, thank you. I think that at least in this panel, and I agree to uh, having huge imbalances in terms of um, not only gender representation, but also ethnical representation, regional representation, educational level representation. We do, we are not the world obviously here. We are, we are only fragment of the world looking at the whole world and trying to say, this is the way we, we think education can help us transform, but uh, obviously there has to be a greater diversity, greater representation of voices. Um, keeping that in mind that we only have that limited perspective, I think the idea that was uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Crowley at the beginning of the first round, the idea of incremental transformation is a very powerful one. And we started talking about some specific and practical approaches that can help address this. And in the second round, I would like us to discuss uh, two things. So one of them is what are those barriers or hindrances to, uh, it seems that we all agree that education can play that role of a, a transforming agency for the world. And it can do a better job of serving global population and serving life and serving the planet and changing uh, values and cultures of our society. So the question is, first of all, what are the barriers? But I don't think we need only need, need to name barriers. I think as, as, a, as a community that talks about global leadership, we need to actually say what needs to be done and how can we lead that change? So what kind of, not only in terms of what, what is needed in general, but as leaders, what do we need to do to overcome those barriers, to make uh, education serve its role for the humanity? So I welcome uh, commentaries and I think we can begin uh, with Dr. Crowley again. Thank you. Um, very good question. I'm a bit concerned about the idea that um, we are leaders talking about leadership. I'd, I'd like to step back from that. Um, whatever leadership education is, it isn't taking people who are leaders and educating them. It's creating the conditions where something called leadership can emerge. And for very good political, cultural, historical reasons, we associate leadership with a certain kind of status enjoyed by people who are called leaders, who are, who are perhaps naturally endowed with the capacities of leadership. We have a heroic model, in other words, of leadership. And of course, Greco-Roman culture uh, leads us to uh, that kind of uh, vision, but other kinds of traditional cultures do too. Maybe one of the transformations we need is to recognize the importance of leadership as a function, not a status. Leadership is something that can be um, practiced at many different levels and can be practiced by different people at different times. So long as we divide, in other words, uh, humanity into the sheep and the shepherd, paraphrasing Michel Foucault on pastoral power, we will probably not resolve the problems we need to resolve. And of course, this goes back to the earlier question of can you transform education in isolation without referring to the broader social system of which education is part, 
clearly uh, the ideas of authority, power, and leadership that are part of our cultural unconscious and which lead us to uh, the kind of elite education for leaders that has been implemented in every country. France is an excellent example. I'm a graduate of um, what's now called Sciences Po, which was created as the École Libre des Sciences Politiques in 1871 by a man called Émile Boutmy, who now uh, has given his name to the biggest lecture hall in the institution, as a direct response to the supposed crisis of leadership that led France to lose the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. The idea that you need an insulated elite, carefully trained in hothouse conditions, you know, like a greenhouse with extra CO2 and so on, to make them leaders, the leaders that by the selection process, they by assumption already were at the beginning. We have to really change that. How to change it is not obvious. What does leadership education look like if you don't know in advance who is destined to be a leader? Let me throw that question back to you. Wonderful question, wonderful. And um, I absolutely agree we need to challenge the premises of the leadership as, as we move into 21st century and we need indeed to find these new models of inclusive leadership. Uh, Nora Bates, a system scientist, talk of liminal leadership, the idea that leadership is distributed in the society that essentially it's not in this heroic figures it's it's in in the connection between all of us so how do we embrace that and how do we indeed it's not only about the heroic leadership but new models of leadership that have to become part of the paradigm i think we move to remus now remus please yeah thank you let me tell you a story as Minister of Education, I used to meet people from the sector and to try to discuss with them directly. Principles of schools are very important when we talk about education, including when we talk about achievement, about the leadership at the local level. And uh, in Romania, there are 40 counties, and I used to meet with all principles <clears throat> Uh, of one county, which more or less was something like from two, 250 to 400 uh, principles at once. And having open discussions for three, four hours, four hours and 30 minutes was the longest one, with a short intervention from my side. And after that, principals asking questions, just the minister and principals of the schools. And at one moment, when I had a discussion about uh, uh, with, with these principles, I started uh, discussing about quality, performance, national exams, better grades. And, uh, you know, I was very committed with my discourse. Uh, and uh, after I finished, a principal, a lady, asked for the floor. And she said, uh, Mr. Minister, let me use myself. I used to be the principal of the best school in this county. Now I'm the principal of one of the worst school of, from the county. I didn't understand what she wanted to say. And she said, uh, based on a decision at the county level, my school merged with the worst school in the county because they were quite close, a distance of a couple of uh, hundreds of meters. Yes, when I was the principal of the best school, I was exactly on the line you mentioned, to have good grades, good results at the national uh, level. Today, my worry is to see the kids clean, fit it, and healthy in the classroom, not on the street. Sometimes education starts big, changes in education starts with local capacity to understand the needs of the kids. And before to speak about achievement, before to speak about what they will learn, what kind of curriculum, we have to be sure our kids are safe. Never mind you are in a safe country like Romania or in a world uh, area. So leadership has different meanings depending on the objectives, 
the objectives of this principle of uh, that specific school was to make progress, to achieve progress for their, uh, for her kids in the school, but first of all, to have the kids in the classroom. Why I mentioned and I shared with you this story, because as was uh, underlined in this session, but also in other sessions, we don't have a unique solution in order to address education. We don't have a unique answer to the same uh, question. We have what we have to do, and let me now move to another uh, idea of my intervention. I think we have to increase the level of debate, discussion, uh, when we talk about education. And this kind of dialogue should be at the regional level, national level, uh, and international level. For this reason, yesterday, it was a mention about UNESCO, liking or not UNESCO. We have to like UNESCO because UNESCO is a global official platform of dialogue. Before to, to identify policies, there is a place where we can discuss when we have expertise, when we, have, uh, we are able to do comparative approach. Also, we need more re uh, 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 resources, including resources to train the leaders of the system. And you know very well, after each global or regional crisis, education and health sectors were the ones suffering. So let's look to the budget of UNESCO after the 2007-2009 crisis, decreased drastically because the interest and the availability of country to contribute or different other actors to contribute decreased. Now we are in the same situation of risk. UNESCO or other NGOs or international organizations working in the field of education will face huge cuts on the budget. So we are not going to uh, uh, improve the system in the next years if we look at the trend. We are going to, to be even in the worse situation than the situation uh, uh, today. We have what, how we can compensate advocating, saying all the time from the morning to the night, education is not just a priority in our discourses. Education has to be a priority in our actions. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we move to Olivier. What is your perspective, especially given that you are working with these communities of leaders that are trying to, to young, young leaders trying to change the world? Yeah, so for, it's more than 12 years now that I've been working with communities around the world, really globally. My, my first experience for five years as executive director of WISE was bringing together incredible projects like Dream a Dream, like, I don't know, big picture learning, uh, design for change in India, M many of Escuela Nueva in Latin America, many incredible projects, making them known. So we are quite good at making the good projects known, show how inspiring they are, uh, recognize the incredible people who have been developing them with their teams, but it usually stops there. How do we empower other people to adapt and adopt these models and grow them is, has been very complicated ever since. So they don't become mainstream or very rarely become mainstream for, so, so that's one of the big challenge about how do we better collaborate in growing these really truly inspiring ways of learning, which are new, which are empowering youth, which are taking care of each other, which are addressing the environmental issues. I mean, it's years and years of fights and sometimes some solutions seem to be quite easy to implement, but it still is not being done. One of the things I've been facing is in running a network of 50 schools for coders in France, which were for needs for people without any degrees, I was invited to do so in Africa. And I met support from the UN or from the European Union or from Agence Française de Développement or for LuxDev, but all of them had loads of programs to scale some of these good initiatives, but none of them would talk to each other. And that's another maybe challenge is how do we better collaborate with a global education coalition for in response to COVID launched by UNESCO, bringing together OECD, Global Partnership for Education, many of these people. This is a good step in, in, in terms of showing that 
these people should collaborate, but how do we make this more effective? It's a big challenge. One on which we really focus is youth are inspired by many of these stories, many of these examples. They are showing the way in many ways, like with the climate movement or the Black Lives Matter movement and many others. So that can be inspiring way for us, but they're not really empowered to have real world impact afterwards. So how do we accompany these youth to let them have some influence? And sometimes it happens, there's a new declaration for planetary and animal rights, which has been pro proposed and presented to the European Union. It started in a small school in Poissy, in one of the most deprived area, but children started to write this declaration and then shared it through, throughout France and then throughout Europe. And, and it is a real progress in a way. So one of the things we're trying to do is making sure that the leaders and global leaders in UNESCO and many other players are really connected to this youth and because this is not very easy. You have incredible vision from activism. You have good vision from big institution, but implementing it uh, is facing many, many systemic problems. And we are trying to align this. So to align this, we're doing this at the city level with ecosystem of players, like the one of Alexei is, is developing in Russia, trying to make sure that we spread in many, many different ways. Uh, so I don't know how clear, I'm, I hope it's, it's clear enough, but uh, I think youth empowerment, Collaboration, collaboration is, is a real big problem. One last thing with the Club of Rome and the planetary emergency um, movement, which is really good, but I, I participate in the conversation too. And there's this kind of feeling that although we represent hundreds of incredible institution group movements and millions or tens of millions of hundreds of millions of people converging, facing lobbies with one simple straight goal is very difficult. And facing a lobby or a system which is, you know, just not moving, is however big and powerful and and visionary we are, is a big challenge. Yeah. Right. Excellent point, Olivier. And that's, I think, something we need to acknowledge because there are really vested rights, uh, vested interests happening in the system that just propagate the model that is working against the whole humanity. Alexei, what's your perspective of, mm -hmm. of Thank you. necessary changes? Uh, talking about leadership and uh, empowering young people to be leaders, uh, I would uh, highlight uh, the barrier of agency. Uh, what I mean, uh, uh, right now we have uh, two uh, stable models in uh, education. I, I think it's uh, the most uh, the same situation in uh, uh, all the countries. Uh, a first model is the model of uh, infantilization when young people are, uh, according to the industrial model, uh, they are in the box, they are in the uh, young people in the same place. Uh, they just uh, waiting uh, for uh, become uh, 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 agents uh, of their own they just listen and uh, you know uh, ad adapt to the world uh, around them uh, another model is uh, the model of uh, personal success personal uh, leadership when you uh, fight with the system when you go to the uh, place uh, uh, better for you like uh, i would say Silicon Valley style leadership when you're just growing from uh, uh, with, uh, with the, your uh, individual uh, success. And uh, uh, I think that the barrier of agency uh, of uh, young people is uh, the very uh, major uh, step uh, if we want to uh, shift the educational paradigm uh, from uh, education as a way of understanding the world to the paradigm education as a way of changing the world, changing your place in the world and changing your local community and adapting uh, new things to your local community. And uh, uh, I think that it, it is impossible to grow this uh, agency, grow this responsibility and the leadership of young people without creating uh, new educational models without creating new social models when uh, young people uh, become responsible for their uh, local communities, for their cultural 
uh, cultural things and uh, etc. Uh, and I, I think that uh, the, the main thing here is that um, adult uh, people, people uh, uh, who uh, make decisions uh, often uh, just ignore the position of young people and uh, their possible uh, agency uh, during this process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Vichal, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Pavel. Uh, I do agree with what Alexia has shared around the focus on student agency. In fact, in the work that the OECD is doing right now in the Education 2030 project, uh, a big shift that the OECD is also making is uh, how do we get education to focus on well being? and well-being of not just the individual, but also the society and the planet. And in order to get there, uh, uh, they're talking about transformative competencies that uh, students will need to have uh, to succeed in this new world. Uh, and these include how are students creating new, new value in the world? How are they taking responsibility uh, in the way they make choices and decisions, which not only impact them, but also impact the families, the communities and the larger planet. Uh, and how they how are they resolving dilemmas and tensions? Again, keeping in mind that students are going to be entering a world which is uh, like one of the earlier speakers said, where the pace of change is increasingly fast, and the future is increasingly complex and uncertain. So there will be a requirement uh, for them to resolve dilemmas and tensions. And at the core of all that is then uh, that the focus of education being around the student agency. Uh, on how students can take initiative, uh, own their own stories, own their own lives, uh, and then make choices which then support them, their community, uh, and the planet. Uh, I think coming to the question of uh, leadership itself, I think a key piece around that is what kind of leadership are we role modeling in our education systems uh, to our students today? And again, if I look at my own experience in the Indian context, uh, the kind of role modeling that we see in the education system is one is uh, deeply hierarchical. Uh, so, you know, people at the national level taking decisions for what education needs to be for say a child in a village uh, somewhere in, in the south of India. Uh, and that I think comes from a deeply embedded uh, bias of uh, lack of trust in the system. Uh, we've created a system uh, in education, I, I reckon also in other parts of our life, uh, where there is complete breakdown of trust. Um, and today as a society, we're living in a crisis of trust. Uh, and we role model that in our education systems when we even don't trust our own students. Uh, when a student is trying to get online, despite all the complications they have in their personal lives, in their communities, in their families, but we, we make an assumption that the student is not committed or interested in education, we mark them absent or we don't let them attend a class. Uh, uh, so that's what we are role modeling. And when we role model lack of trust or a crisis of trust, then that's what students pick up as the way society needs to operate. That I operate uh, or at a level of an individual with individual well being and individual success and not looking at anyone else's well being and success. So we're looking at a societal transformation in a highly fast changing, complex world we need to rebuild trust in the system. And that's the kind of leadership we need to project. And that can happen potentially when we decentralize more. A teacher in a classroom knows best what's needed for his or her students in the classroom. They don't need to have someone sitting in the capital of the country telling them how learning should happen or how education should happen. We need to learn to trust our teachers. I, don't know, I remember speaking to this principal at a school in Finland uh, who was also a teacher trainer and uh, you know I was talking to them about why Finland is so successful and they said you know we, we, we trust our training that we provide to our teachers we trust our selection processes to select the right kind of teachers and then we just let them go we trust them and what they do in the classroom is completely up to them because we've trained them well we've selected the right kind of people and now we trust the system to deliver what is needed to deliver in education that doesn't exist in the education system today, at least in many contexts, including India. And the third point, and I want to close with that, 
is that the key aspect is also that there's a certain narrative of leadership in the world that we have built and believed in. Uh, and that's the narrative that is also fed to our students in the education system. And the narrative again comes from a largely alpha male individual success. He, uh, someone else also said about heroic success kind of models. Uh, but if you look at the current crisis again, if you look at the top five countries in the world who have uh, suffered the most in this pandemic, all have leaders who are very alpha male centric. That is, if you look at some of the countries who have done very well in managing this crisis, they've been female leaders. If you look at Finland or New Zealand uh, or Germany, where there are, there's female leadership at a political level, they've handled the crisis much better than say a US or an India or a UK. Uh, if you look at the whole Black Lives Matter movement, Till yesterday, I didn't know the Black Lives Matter movement was started by three women because they're completely invisible and they're more driven by a collective service-oriented leadership rather than being visible and showing up. So again, if we want to create societal transformation and we want to reimagine education from that lens, then we need to reimagine leadership to be service-oriented, to be collective and collaborative leadership and probably be provocative, being more feminist in this leadership. Thank you, Vishal. Beautiful remarks. Um, and I think the, the topic of uh, changing the perspective, the, the narrative of leadership comes on uh, comes again and again. So I would like maybe other panelists who will contribute to also address that as a question. And the question of how do we uh, spread trust across the system? That seemed to be very, very central to all of our conversation. Uh, our next speaker, I think, is Rodolfo, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. I try to, to share my screen. Yes, this time it looks working. And, and then uh, I like to go back to the, uh, what, uh, again, what uh, John uh, Crowley said about leadership that we have to be careful to use uh, um, concept clarity. And leadership uh, is a, an ambiguous uh, uh, concept right now. And because uh, it's uh, mostly tied to the old vision uh, that is uh, uh, linked to the old paradigm of uh, the Newtonian approach that you see as a red path in the, in the slide. That, has, that is the, the paradigm that caused a lot of problems, a lot of destruction of our own, on our world, because it was an incomplete uh, paradigm uh, that uh, with uh, many, many flaws. And then uh, we are just in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the, the transformative approach, uh, jumping to a new paradigm that is uh, linked to the quantum field theory, that is uh, something that uh, all the all the participants to this panel uh, already know quite well because uh, you need a deep knowledge of your local reality, your group reality, your national reality, and uh, and uh, and uh, is something that you have to learn by interacting with, with your reality, and that's the reality of complex systems. And then again, system thinking is an another uh, um, ambiguous concept. Because uh, when we talk about system thinking, usually we refer to the, to the red path. That is the old one. We need uh, a complex system thinking. To be clear that we, when we talk about uh, system thinking, we have to refer to the yellow path. That is the new one. The, the one linked to, uh, to quantum field theory that it takes into consideration the human component. And that, that's something fundamental. Uh, in, uh, because uh, at that time, when you take into consideration in the scientific paradigm, the human component, then you have to, to, to ask these questions. What is physical? What is non-physical? Because uh, we all know that there is something physical that cannot be, be measured because we perceive that. An example, love. Love, we perceive love, but we cannot measure that. So usually we assume that is non-physical or something else like infrared radiation. 
is something physical, but uh, we are unable to perceive that with our eyes. So cannot, it can be measured, but not perceived. So we need a, a con a clear concepts to, if we go to, if we like to grow. And then when you start thinking in this way, then you discover uh, something really interesting that somebody else already thought about that. That is, the, the day science begins to study non physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all previous centuries of its experience. You know, that was Tesla huh? at the beginning of, of our of the past century. And then when you start uh, following this, this path, then you re realize that uh, the past track, the red track, focused only on systems in a, in, in, in a complete way focusing on direct space, the Euclidean space, the usual space we deal uh, already. But then with the new approach, you have to be aware that is not the only space we have to deal with. And usually we deal with many other spaces we are not aware of, but we are accustomed to by our experience. And those are the co direct space, reciprocal space, reciprocal co-space. But then uh, the red path, force you to ignore all the relationships with other spaces. And so we lose a lot of information, but not only the direct information, but even the cross information between them. And so we are unable to link the our outer universe, the external universe representation with our inner universe representation. And the new approach is able to just to give you the tools to build those links and to have this new vision. And then you can, can start talking about the coherence because at that level, you have coherence and not just synchronization. That's, th those are two completely different conce concepts. You know, uh, synchronization is based on, the, on statistical assumptions. Coherence is uh, based on combinatorial assumptions. And, uh, and I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Rodolfo, for your contribution. And um, Carlos, uh, please, what's, yes. what's your perspective? Uh, my perspective, I mean, a lot has been already said. I would like to start, since we talk about leadership, I would like to, to use a, a quotation, uh, so, sorry, a citation from a from one of the biggest leaders of the 20th century. And also a little bit in tribute to, to our Indian colleagues, Lata, Janani, uh, and, and, and their colleagues who are behind the scenes making that this happen. And the citation is by Mahatma Gandhi. He said, well, you know, uh, speed is not relevant if we go in the wrong direction. And uh, we are a bit overwhelmed with the idea that uh, everything is going faster. And we have to be cautious about the idea that because everything is going faster, we have to go faster. We are first to find uh, <laughs> a little bit more what is the right direction, which in my view is uh, the shift in epistemology, in, in worldviews. Uh, that we have several of yourselves have already mentioned and, and myself in my previous intervention through something which in my view will change completely the nature of leadership. Um, Mahatma Gandhi built his own leadership from humility, from deep humility, which is completely the opposite of the existing model of, of leadership we see in the, in the, in the TV screens and everywhere, right? So this is a long um, Nora Bateson's uh, liminal leadership concept. Uh, Petra Kunkel calls it collective leadership. I like uh, Vishal mentioned invisible leadership. But that means that um, I have sympathy for what John Crowley said uh, before about let's change education as a semi-closed system. I think we have to couple that with cultural transformation without cultural transformation, this will not work. Because we put so much in our educational system of our culture, of the dominant cultural values. Basically, education is a system to reproduce uh, cultural values. 
and uh, to reproduce our fears, uh, the, the perception of our needs, what is acceptable, what is not. And uh, we have to make some fundamental changes about all of that, the fears, the perceived needs, what is acceptable. I think there is a lot around to do, to work from. I mean, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, many cultures are still alive, fortunately. And uh, in a way we have to go to revisit uh, them. You know, the cultures which have been dominated in the two, three centuries. You know, this is not about let's go to the past. This is about let's, let's build a desirable future with together with cultures which have been ignored and just to put uh, an example uh, with uh, ubuntu you know the under the name ubuntu this idea of many different african cultures actually but built around the idea of interdependencies relationships and i am because you are this is not easy uh, for sure uh, i mean as olivier has pointed uh, the, the core of the system is stuck and it's very difficult to to make that move, but uh, this is also a moment in which parents have the feeling, at least in many countries and definitely in Western countries, parents have the feeling that the future of their kids will be worse than their own. This is a moment of rupture, so the, the kids will not be okay. And by the way, the kids are saying the same. So this is a moment, an opportunity of rupture, which we could profit from to build something new. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you also, Olivier, for your comment in the in the chat about the culture of hope, which I think is so essential to the to the transformation we are going through. Uh, Gary, uh, please over to you. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. I'd like to go back to John's opening remarks in this round because I think he's touched a very important point about the relationship between the individual and the society. And actually this is, if you think about it, this is a fundamental weak point in our social sciences because we have, uh, with the exception of psychology and even that not very exceptionally, we have tended to treat the social sciences as natural sciences, normative sciences where we're looking at statistics and data and have really not understood the real role of the individual in social processes. We treat the individual in isolation in psychology, and then we treat the collective uh, without really bridging the gap. I think that uh, uh, the, the comment that John made is very important because when we framed this project of global leadership, we spent a lot of time emphasizing that we're not just talking about the individual who changes the world. That's only one step in a process. And that's the word I prefer to use. Leadership is a process that starts in the mind of somebody, according to Margaret Mead, all great change starts in the mind of one or a few individuals and then spreads from there and goes through a process. And when we talk about social tr transformation, we're talking about that process. And of course, it's not a one-way process because the individual himself is a result of that process in the collective going back and forth. Our thoughts in the, in the individual are a result of the awareness, awakening, and experience of the collective. So I think this flagged a very important point. And that's, in, in our view, central to this project of global leadership. By all means, it's not an, an individual or a group that are going to change the world. There's leadership in thought. There's leadership in goals. The SDGs are providing leadership. We have very bad leadership in our measures of performance like GDP. It's leading us in the wrong direction. We have organizational leadership uh, like uh, what UNESCO is trying to uh, uh, provide at an ess essential place. Uh, we have leadership of the NGOs and so forth who have done like uh, banning the landmines, leadership in values, which is fundamental. So I, I really think that he's raised a very important point when we're talking about social process, we're not just talking about what somebody did or a set of external events. We're talking about a process which has very appropriately, Rudolfo has put up his, uh, uh, his slide there, 
there is an outer part of this, which is objective, observable, and to some extent measurable. Uh, and there is an inner or what we've been calling subjective dimension of this, which at the social level is very nebulous and often goes unperceived. And the reality is in the meeting uh, of these two, they're always related to each other, but our science tends to separate them as if there's a wall of difference between what's happening inside us and outside us. So my point in saying this is that to change, to do the social transformation or to change our education, it also means we have to change our thinking because we are been conditioned, I'm particularly talking in the West, though I've spent half my life in, uh, in the East, in India, uh, we've been conditioned to think of objective reality and ignore or downplay uh, the subjective dimension of it. And we see today how important the subjective dimension is to social change. It's only when the inner urge, aspiration, demand, insistence, expectation, uh, uh, loss of trust or change of values comes that we get that outer change. So we've been in the academy arguing, it's, we can't just deal with policies, we can't just in, deal with institutions, we can't just deal with acts. We have to try to understand the social construction of knowledge which, uh, uh, or reality, which Alberto is constantly reminding us of, the way we think, the way we partition reality arbitrarily into so many small pieces and actually behave as if they're separate from one another. So we've had economic theory for two centuries, which ignored the fact that there's an environment. Uh, that, that's different. That our, our, or now it's been ignoring the fact that economy and political science, originally it was political economy. And then the economist said, no, no, we must have a range, a field of our own. But the reality, there is no economy external or separate from the political and the legal and social context. So we need to, if we're gonna change our education and we're gonna change our society, we have to change with a, a change in the way we're thinking. And that is a profound evolutionary change. And no wonder it's difficult. We don't have to uh, fault ourselves for that. It's an evolution, it's a civilizational evolution. Thank you, Gary. Um... I would like, first of all, to ask the audience if you have um, any further questions to the panelists as we are reaching the end of this panel, or maybe panelists would like to make their final comments. And uh, meanwhile, I just wanted to react to what you were saying, Gary. I think there are uh, so many important dimensions you are touching. And uh, specifically, one of them is that indeed we are treating in our education, we are focusing on individuals. We don't really embrace that collective uh, dimension uh, explicitly. And uh, I would argue that one of the transformations that we need to uh, accomplish is to recognize that this collective dimension is there and that collective learning is happening and that we need to create an equivalent of pedagogy or andragogy that is focusing on individuals for collective dimension of learning. And that is probably one of our collective challenges. Um, Alberto, would you like to guide the next stage as we are approaching the end of this conversation? Okay. Um, actually, <laughs> as Gary has uh, predicted, I still want to speak about uh, an important tool of promoting change. As Oliver pointed out, uh, you know, we have a good uh, uh, example of things that are working, uh, uh, but it's so difficult to promote the change. I think uh, it's difficult no matter what, but it's not certainly helping that uh, we do not have the use uh, of tools that are already available. And uh, sociology of knowledge uh, offer us effective tools to understand how reality is created uh, in society, in every aspect of society, 
and also in education. You know, education is too abstract. <laughs> you have to understand what are the building blocks of education and how they can change. To just to give you a few examples, how teachers training is carried out is totally obsolete to reach, and Ramos knows this very well, to reach the goals the government to say we need to reach. They're written, but then they still train. Uh, and also uh, financial uh, allotments. Just to give you an example, my institute uh, uh, has a, a, a program that is called Teachers Effective in Training and uh, use uh, the person center approach uh, to train those teachers. And uh, in Italy, we have done for 60,000 teachers and 1,000 school principal. Very often, uh, I have heard people emotionally uh, you know activated they say i'm very close of retirement i have been uh, through so many teachers training and this is the first time uh, that somebody helps me to understand the importance of listening instead of speaking up what we have uh, is a situation where we do not need to reinvent the wheel. Carlos was saying about Ubuntu, you know, let's not be so always, uh, you know, European centric in our pedagogy. There is another uh, pedagogy that is uh, called Walking on Beauty and is the community of Native American teaching uh, their younger to be in touch with themselves and the environment. They're so much in touch and deeply in communion that they ask permission to an animal or a tree before using them. Uh, we have a, a lot in the West uh, research showing that, for example, student-centered approach, or even better, people-centered approach really works why we do not use it. We have to understand uh, that uh, changing uh, is also hitting uh, some soft spot, the power issues. You know, people that do have power do, do not like uh, to share power. And this is true also of teachers because we train them that uh, if they are not, <laughs> you know, tough, uh, that the students uh, would run amok. Actually, the research showed that if you empower students, uh, there's going to be much better behavior in the classroom and less uh, absenteeism. Also, we do not uh, trust people, somebody you know, said very eloquently. But uh, uh, we have plenty of proof uh, in research uh, and also the Bologna process says that one of the last reports said we are not making inroads soon enough. We need that to empower students. We need to be more student centered. We need that to include students in curriculum development. We need to include the students in self evaluation. We have plenty in my institute, uh, the people that are after four years becoming psychotherapists, they have to self-evaluate themselves, uh, have the feedback of their fellow, you know, <laughs> postgraduate uh, students, and then they get also our uh, feedback. But the decision uh, is collective, and they're much more tough uh, than uh, we professor, because uh, we renounce to the role of professor and became more humbly facilitator of learning. So there is a political significant aspect, but we're not going to see how to really promote change unless we incentivate. For example, to give me a last example, 
Well, you know, universities are desperate for money, especially in this COVID emergency. If government would give more funds to university that promote student-centered approaches, you will see that not for goodwill, but for self-interest, things would change. Like if you give a fiscal incentive to put the solar panels on top of your roof, a lot of more people would you know, follow through. So we have to understand how change also can be promoted and not discover something mystical because we know already, we already have needed to focus and support each other in learning from each other and especially to bring a new form of leadership because we, we have new leaders. That could be a very bad failure. The world is full of leaders, and that's one of the problems. Leaders that are too narcissistic, too egoistic, too selfish, and they are very charismatic, but they bring a lot of... We need the sustainable that people bring from natural leaders already in the community to have uh, the voices. And like somebody has pointed out, sometimes it's difficult even for ourselves. Let's really realize that. Why we are all men in this panel is not by ill will, but still is a reality. And still the voices that are heard are our voice. So for example, the good thing is next panel, let's have a, make a sure or not let's have a panel unless we have a equal representation, not only of sexes, but also voices from different parts of the world. And that would be a political stance we are not able to do that. Let's be silent. Excellent point, Alberto. It is a, indeed a political issue and, and indeed we need to do a better job of uh, recognizing the limited perspective that we are giving in panels like this and how can we be more, much more inclusive. Uh, by the way, uh, tomorrow uh, we will try to actually practice that in a different format that we hold together with young leaders on uh, the future of education. And that will be not a panel, it will be a collaborative co-creative session where, where young people will be able to work together in groups and that we're aiming to have much more diverse perspectives. So I think we need to move towards that kind of formats in general in our conversation. So um, any last remarks, dear participants? And um, I think we more or less proceed, proceed. Yeah, Rodolfo, please. Just, just a few words uh, on uh, bec uh, going back to John Crowley point that on leadership that is uh, is becoming an ambiguous term, you know, because I think that uh, uh, might be well uh, talking about leadership and uh, instead of leadership, and leadership uh, comes from trust, and trust comes from sharing. Um, the right knowledge to provide better solutions to old problems. And I think that um, is something we have uh, to, uh, to care about because uh, this kind of uh, leading uh, is, comes from a existential experience. And that's, uh, that's the point. We don't need uh, just the learning on books only. We need to be deeply interacting with our reality. And uh, if you uh, are, uh, the deeper you are uh, interacting with your reality, the, uh, the better you're leading. Thank you. Great point. Any last comments? Please, John. Yeah, just uh, thank you for all those comments, just to agree with the key point that's just been made by several of you that we're talking about issues of a political nature. And that's not a problem. And we shouldn't be shy about it. 
education has always been a political project because it has been about defining what a citizen needs to know, which among other things has also meant defining who doesn't deserve to be a citizen and doesn't deserve to know that. Um, so the question of equality of access to knowledge defined in terms of the character, ethos, and needs of a political community has been the subject matter of meta thinking about education uh, ever since the very first tracts about the issue of which Plato's Republic can perhaps serve as a, a convenient starting point, though it's not necessarily the first. Um, the point being that when we say, as someone said very correctly in the chat, these are political issues, not technical issues, one rather natural response is to run away and say, so we shouldn't touch them. In fact, the opposite is true. Precisely because they are political issues, they are things we absolutely must touch. Of course, for an organization like UNESCO, this is very difficult because for us, political means diplomatic and the conditions of political possibility are determined by diplomatic consensus, which is necessarily a minimal consensus, often strongly biased towards the status quo because it's very difficult to get a consensus on any particular direction of change, even if the status quo is not necessarily popular. But at the same time, everything we're saying about the nature of leadership is also a series of statements, implicit or explicit, about the kind of society within which things need to be led, processes, communities, groups, and so on. Um, and those statements are by definition political statements. And I'd just like to close uh, thinking to everything that's been, that's been said for various reasons. Um, the face of Benjamin Barber came into my mind. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, uh, um, an eminent political theorist who died a couple of years ago uh, with whom I worked in the 1990s. One of his books, um, he was a theorist of democracy, a very big admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau in particular. One of his most interesting books is called The Aristocracy of Everyone, which is his book about his idea of what a true democracy would look like. And of course, the whole point is the apparent contradiction in terms, an aristocracy of everyone. Every cultural framework we have for thinking about aristocracy, the government of the best, in other words, our idea of heroic leadership is premised on the idea that only a few can be the best. What would an aristocracy of everyone look like? Ultimately, that's the political horizon we're discussing here. And even though the book I'm referring to was published over 20 years ago, it, it is still the horizon that we need to grapple with. The easy option is to say that's too political. Let's focus on technical things like skills for jobs. But we know that doesn't work. So let's not be shy. Let's actually embrace the challenge of being thoroughly and explicitly political, which means there will be fundamental disagreements about the political nature of what we're talking about, but there's no way of evading them. They are the subject matter. They're not roadblocks on the way to the subject matter. Let's try to build that aristocracy of everyone through education. That is a very Rousseauian way of thinking about things. Thank you. Any further comments? Thank well, you, and, uh, yes, please, Gary. Pavel and uh, Alberto for wonderful moderation of this very interesting discussion. And for all of your contributions. Thank you very much for the conversation today. And uh, I think, again, we, we have such big questions that we literally only can start to scratch the surface. But I think one of the ways to go forward is to look at ourselves and many others whose voices were not in the panel today as holders of the space where some of these changes that we're talking about can actually occur. The question that Olivia has posed is how do we inc increase level of collaboration between ourselves and many others? And how do we move together? How do we learn to overcome the old paradigm lobbies that are just propagating the old system because of some vested interest? That's very important. And I agree completely with what John, you are saying. We cannot do away with, with political issues because they are central to all of these conversations. And we cannot hope that consensus alone is a way of finding 
the solution will, will bring us forward. We need to actually probably be, be more bold in recognizing there is an ultimate need for that transformation. It's driven by those higher values that we all try to profess. So uh, as my conclusion, as my final remark, I encourage us to look at opportunities where we can practically do some of the things we're discussing here and do them right now, today, tomorrow, not wait another year to actually make those changes happen. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating today. Thank you also from my part, uh, also to the uh, many people in the supporting staff. Uh, and uh, please uh, be aware that uh, this panel and all the panel are registered as well as uh, the supporting material that you will find uh, on the website uh, of the World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, and if you wish, uh, you can have also free uh, uh, subscription uh, for our two scientific journal. And I wish myself uh, and all of you to be able to go ahead uh, and be part of the solution and not of the problem uh, and uh, find it meaningful in uh, actualizing or trying to what we believe in. I learned a lot of things and I was stimulated. Uh, and so thank you all for that. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. you.